David, as always, we're thankful to have you here. We really appreciate your time, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Please welcome David Bartlett. Mm. Thanks, Mark. Well, thank you, Bob, and thank you to the organisers of the conference for the invitation um, to address you today. And it was a very pleasant surprise, I've got to say, um, just a few days ago when the conference organisers rang up and said, oh, one of the speakers has cancelled, so would it be OK if you spoke for 40 minutes instead of 20 minutes? Little hint, never give an ex-politician uh, the opportunity to speak for longer, because chances are they'll grab it with both hands, you know. Uh, suffer, suffering audience deprivation is one of the things post-politics. Uh, anyway, it is lovely to be here and while I am going to talk about schools in a digitally disrupted world, I really want to focus today, I guess, on how um, what's happening in the world, particularly due to ubiquitous connectivity, is changing everything and what I think the impacts perhaps are, and I'm not an educator, while I was Minister for Education for four years, I'm certainly not an educator, what I think some of the implications for uh, schools are. And I'm going to try and define this term, the platform economy, and I guess um, what that means for schools. And um, no doubt uh, this talk will raise many, many more questions than it answers. But thankfully, I've got another hour to talk uh, this afternoon at the workshop down the road where I'm going to be trying to build on a more practical sense about um, some of the things I talk about today as well. So, first of all, I'd like you uh, to introduce you to my. Um, 11, soon to be 12 year old son. I can see some people in the audience who know him well because there's some of his uh, former t current teachers and former teachers uh, in the audience. Now Hudson's, um, you know, okay at school. He gets reports a bit like uh, his dad used to, you know, bright enough but must try harder and focus more. Uh, he's, uh, he has, he's blessed to have go to an outstanding public, local public school and have had outstanding, extraordinarily um, fantastic teachers um, through the course of his um, primary school career. He's going on to the local uh, um, high school that his dear old dad went to as well uh, next year. Two things Hudson is absolutely obsessed about, cars, he loves cars, and he loves his food, loves pizza. Now, the reason why I introduced my son, he's not a particularly extraordinary uh, uh, miracle of a boy or anything, but he is a pizza entrepreneur. That is, at 11 years old, he designs sells, markets, and delivers pizzas for his pocket money. Uh, and I'm going to get on to what I mean by that and uh, how he comes to, uh, to be that, uh, that in a moment. What I want to make the argument today to you is that ubiquitous connectivity has radically altered the value of things. And if you'll just excuse me a moment. Those who were at the TPA conference last year, it's always a pleasure to speak all over Australia and other countries and so on. It's so much nicer to be here speaking in my own home territory, so um, thank you. Um, but I argued last year and I argue again that ubiquitous connectivity, the fact that we are all connected via devices like this, if you like, or the GPS in your car or your internet enabled fridge or your uh, piece of wearable health technology like your Fitbit or your jawbone or what have you, has radically altered the world. The way we create wealth the way we have a conversation with our customers, our constituents, our students, our learners, and also the way we solve some old and wicked public policy problems. The best way of describing or illustrating what ubiquitous connectivity or what that change looks like, this step function change, and uh, apart from those in the room last year when I asked this question who aren't allowed to answer these pop quiz questions, um, anyone want to sing out where uh, these two photos were taken? Vatican, correct, there's Catholic education in the audience, that's great. <laughs> no. uh, so this was at the election of Pope uh, Benedict, election of Pope Francis. I love the guy down the bottom right hand corner who's having a good old go with the uh, snap out Motorola. Uh, I, I get a bit nostalgic about technology and that's only though 10 years old. In the space of one very short reign of one Pope, the world changed radically. And this is the best image I can find to define or to, to illustrate what that change looks like. Um, and it radically changed, the, that, that um, step function change in connectivity has radically changed the value of things. And value is an interesting word, you can use, define it how you want to, but another pop quiz question that the Tasmanians who have heard me speak aren't allowed to answer, this is um, 
this is Screen Siren, Academy Award winning actor Anne Hathaway. Uh, this is the Wall Street Bull, so if you go to the New York Stock Exchange, bull out the front, representing the sort of bull market. Um, can anyone in the audience tell me uh, what the relationship between Anne Hathaway and the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index is? What was that one? They look alike. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> not going there. Well, I'll give you the answer because I've only got 40 minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the answer is this. Every time Anne Hathaway gets a rave review or uh, wins an Academy Award or gets a new big uh, production Hollywood movie announced that Anne Hathaway is going to star, uh, uh, star in, uh, the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index, that is the value of all the stocks on uh, the New York Stock Exchange, goes up 2 or 3%. This is not financial advice, see your own brokers. Uh, the reason why? Because 75% of all of the trades on all of the New York's, all of the US stock exchanges, that is 7 billion individual shares that are traded each day, 75% of those trades are actually done by high speed big data algorithms running on high speed computers that are essentially trawling the internet for sentiment. And what they find when Anne Hathaway wins an Academy Award is that there's positive sentiment about Hath the word Hathaway. As it turns out, the Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett, the greatest stock tra trader of all time, his own private or pu publicly listed vehicle is called Berkshire Hathaway. And as intelligent as these big data algorithms are, they can't tell the difference between sentiment about Anne Hathaway and Berkshire Hathaway. So Warren must be buying, we should buy, let's buy, and the stock exchange uh, index goes up. This is a game that if you had a 13 year old spotty boy living in your uh, house in 2001, a game called EverQuest. It's an MPORG, a massively multiplayer online role playing game. You get the picture, I don't have to describe what it is, but you know, largely boys in, you know, uh, playing online, role character playing. But what was extraordinary about EverQuest back in 2001, speaking of the, um, the, the change to the way, the value of things, is that it was discovered by a bloke called Ed Castroneva, who wrote a PhD, that in fact there were 14 people who'd become millionaires playing this game across the world. Some 14 million people playing the game. How did they become millionaires? Well, they discovered, because there's no prize money or anything, they discovered that taking the assets, the castles, weapons, tracts of land, whatever else, um, out of uh, EverQuest, a place that doesn't actually exist except for ones and zeros stored in a server farm somewhere, and selling those assets, virtual assets that don't actually exist on eBay, because eBay was on the rise in 2001 as well, people would pay, time poor people who wanted to get into the game, would pay real American dollars for those assets. Now those assets, this became so prevalent that one guy actually opened a sweatshop south of the border in Mexico, paid Mexicans 25 cents an hour to play the game on his behalf, took the virtual assets they created and sold them on eBay. It became so prevalent, in fact, that at one stage, EverQuest, measured as gross domestic product per capita, largely the way we measure the wealth of nations, was the 89th richest country on the planet, and it doesn't actually exist. There were exchange rates websites set up between the EverQuest gold coin, a currency that doesn't exist other than ones and noughts in a computer somewhere, and the American dollar. Now, why do I tell you this? This is also my son Hudson, taken a couple of years ago, begging me for yet another in-app purchase on his iPad. Now, anyone who's a parent here of an 11-year-old boy will know that when he says, Dad, can I download this game? It's free. You know it's not free because you know there's going to be a set of wheels or a set of weapons or another thing that needs to be bought for real Australian dollars. The industry now, from EverQuest to this, across the world, we buy, as humankind, $20 billion a year of virtual products. Products that don't actually exist. But, uh, and now if that's not radically transforming the way we think about value in things, I don't know what is. Let's get a bit more realistic then. The principal of my local school uh, allowed me to run a little 3D printing course uh, a year or two ago for the kids. It was really just an excuse to convince my wife that I should buy it, spend $2,000 on a little 3D printer for home. Uh, and what I discovered during that process, or what the, the kids really taught me, was that their designs could now be published on a marketplace or a platform. So anything the kids at our local primary school designed, 
could actually be put on a marketplace for anyone around the world to design. Now, I've got this spanking new wonderful Apple iWatch and I want a new band for it. I can go to this marketplace and buy for $54.79 the band, but I'm not actually buying the band. I'm buying the digital file that contains the data and information in it that I can download to my printer and print the band at my house. I guarantee you that within three years, when Frank Bansell, who I know loves trendy glasses frames, wants a new pair of trendy glasses frames, he won't go down the road to buy them at the shop. He will look up the trendiest, coolest designer in you know, Greenwich Village, Manhattan. He'll buy the design, he'll download the file, and he'll print the glasses frames to his own printer in the comfort of his own home. You think about that travel of, remember when we used to have the laser printer? It was the magic box about this big and cost $15,000, and heaven forbid that it should actually do colour, and it was, fit, you know, and it sat in the corner and only certain people were allowed to use it. Um, the, tra the trajectory of that, that now everyone's got a laser printer sitting in their home under their desk, we've got three in fact, um, the trajectory of that price is going to be the same trajectory of price in terms of 3D printing. So, this is now gratuitous child shot number two, this is my gorgeous daughter Matilda, uh, doing an aeroplane ride under daddy, uh, on top of daddy uh, while he's holding the iPhone in one hand underneath the Eiffel Tower um, in September of last year. I took my kids to the Northern Hemisphere for the very first time. Um, of course, the last time we went to the Northern Hemisphere as tourists was some 12 years ago. I know that for Larissa and I because it was bef before we had kids and it was a great trip. <laughs> the second trip was great too, don't get me wrong. That wasn't the only difference between the two trips though. Of course, the first trip when Larissa and I were young and in love and had no children, uh, we took the Lonely Planet Guide, that enormous big fat tablet book. We cut out Estonia and all the other countries we weren't going to go to to save the way. Uh, and that was the, pl the thing that told us in one voice where to go, where to eat, where to sleep, what to buy, how to get there, what to see when we got there, written by one journalist in one voice. Of course, this time, just a year ago, and Facebook keeps on reminding me that a year ago you were a downtown Bruges drinking beer. I'd much rather be here, of course. Uh, um, a year ago, uh, when we took our kids to, uh, uh, to the UK or to Europe, what did we use? We used TripAdvisor. Now, what is TripAdvisor? It is a platform. And here we go into the definition of what I mean by the rise of the platform economy. It's a platform or a marketplace in which a ubiquitously connected community, the fact is that we're all connected to these things, can share knowledge about it, a travel. I don't have to listen to one voice. I can co-create with other travellers my experiences. And I can tell you that TripAdvisor is much better, much richer, much more accurate, uh, has much more dense information, has a, just as Wikipedia has far more knowledge in it than Encyclopedia Britannica ever did, so too uh, TripAdvisor has far more knowledge, more accurate knowledge, and more ability to co-construct knowledge on that platform than Lonely Planet ever did. As a side story, Lonely Planet was sold to the BBC at about the election of that first pope for $660 million US. The BBC on-sold Lonely Planet at the election of the second pope for $35 million US. That's how much value the platform of TripAdvisor or the platform economy stripped out of the old way of tablets of stone knowledge, we know it all and here is um, our knowledge. Of course, when we travelled around Europe, we used Uber to get from train station to station, train station, train station. What is it? It's basically a platform on which um, those who want a ride can share a ride with someone who wants to share a ride. We booked every, all of our accommodation on Airbnb. What's Airbnb? It's a platform on which those who have a room to rent can get together with those who want to rent a room. Uh, it, has, it now, Airbnb by the way, rents more rooms in Manhattan every night than the entire Manhattan hotel room stock. So it is completely, like TripAdvisor, transformed the way we think about travel and the way we think about accessing shared resources and so on. In fact, now 80% of the value in Silicon Valley based companies are in platform businesses, not unlike these ones. It's easy to work, do the maths on this. Uber five years ago was worth zero. It's now worth 17 billion US. So that will give you an indication of where that value is coming from. And of course the platform economy 
um, the rise of these businesses that are creating platforms on which we can co-construct the knowledge, the experiences, the, the product, in fact, that we want, are, um, are completely changing the nature of work as well, in my view. This is my friend uh, Matt Barry. I say my friend because um, I met him in 2010 in a Washington DC bar and uh, he explained to me he was going to start a business called Freelancer and it was going to be a platform marketplace in which anyone who could design a logo or write some web code or sing a jingle or write a jingle or do whatever could get together with anyone across the world um, to sell that service or for someone who wants to buy that service. And I, I remember going back to the hotel room that night and saying, Larissa, I met this crazy guy in the bar. What an insane idea. Uh, of course, um, now five years later, it's worth $750 million on the Australian Stock Exchange. So I say my friend Matt Barry has, uh, <laughs> has completely changed, and, and many other platforms like him, the way that the next generation are going to think about work. And in my view, it is going to lead to the death of the job as we know it. Let me explain a bit more about that though. KPMG now have an internal marketplace where there's a particular R&D tax re uh, rebate thing that all their clients want them to do, but they can't uh, do it uh, profitably as a business. So they've created an internal platform, an internal marketplace, where the young graduates who are working, getting salary from KPMG, can now bid on extra jobs to do after hours at a lower rate but money in their pocket. So this platform economy is not only disrupting the way we think about work and the way people access work and knowledge and experience and skills and a whole range of things, but it's also disrupting internally to businesses. And of course we know um, from so many reports that technology, you know, the rise of the robot if you like, is seeing a massive change to the way we think about work in Australia, particularly this is an Australian report by Price Waterhouse, and of course it says that Basically, 44% of uh, Australian jobs aren't going to exist in 20 years' time. I think it's more like 10 years' time um, that a lot of these jobs are going to be crunched and changed. But it's not as simple as saying that technology is taking jobs or changing or in threatening jobs. It's just changing the nature of them, in my view. In uh, Michelin star restaurants in the UK, uh, they did a blind test. So these are the restaurants that all the foodies go to. Um, and uh, they did a blind test that when you ordered a coffee at the end of your meal, I can see here people tweeting out there. That's good, thanks. I can see that. Borto74, where are you? Um, <laughs> uh, uh, that, um, speaking of ubiquitously connected, uh, that when they did a blind test of you know, these food snobs, foodies, I'd say food snobs, that's a pejorative term, uh, uh, ordering a coffee, um, when they did the blind test, they found that actually the Nestle pod machine delivered better, more consistent coffee to these foodies. They voted more consistently for the machine than for the barista. But this is the job market for baristas in Australia over recent times. Off the scale, there's more jobs for baristas in Australia than ever before, and it doesn't look, the growth in it doesn't look like a baby. So it's not as simple to say that technology is going to take these jobs Actually, when we're buying a coffee, of course, we're buying a story. We're buying the story of the, you know, Guatemalan monkey who excreted the bean or something or other and, you know, hand rolled by whatever and created by the barista that I have a conversation with because that's, you know, reflects something about me and my value and what I value in life. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's, what I'm trying to say here is it's trite to say that technology is wiping out jobs, but it's not trite to say that technology is really changing, massively changing the way we think about work and the th way the people who are in your care and the people who you are educating are going to experience the world as they leave school. And this brings me to, back to almost, to Hudson and his pizza business. Up until a, really recently, and that is the rise of the platform economy, um, basically, there was one business model on the planet. Since the agrarian revolution, um, industrial revolution maybe, but probably the agrarian revolution, we made products, we sold them to customers, we did some form of innovation. Uh, new widget, new price, new colour, new whatever, um, new marketing plan. 
And then we made more products and sold them to customers, repeat and you know, rinse. The platform economy looks different to that. And that is products get wrapped in personalized services. And those personalized services, just checking my time, um, then when they really hit maturity, become platforms or marketplaces in which the, the participants in that marketplace, think Airbnb, think Uber, think TripAdvisor, are actually co-creating uh, the product that the consumers and the participants in that uh, platform, that marketplace, are consuming. So back to Hudson Pizza. I always like to put the hashtag up there because tonight in your hotel room, if you want a pizza, you know, it's late, you've had a few drinks and you need a pizza, I'd encourage you to look up Hudson Pizza. Because Don Mage, who's the CEO of Domino's Pizza, worked out that this was an old way of doing business. You know, the seemingly undisruptible business of delivering pizzas is, you know, Dad's tired on Friday night, rings up, orders half Aussie, half Hawaiian, you know, please, you know, 45 minutes, that's the only innovation in pizza, let's face it, the half Aussie, half Hawaiian. Uh, and, uh, uh, and 45 minutes, doorbell goes and, and um, pizza arrives. What Don Mage worked out is that, who's the CEO of Domino's, if he created personalised service around that via an app, he could um, expand his market, and he did. Created an app, and did basically with that app, allows you to personalise your pizza. I don't want the Aussie or the Hawaiian. I want to choose my own ingredients and drag them, drop them onto my pizza. And when I hit buy, I can now see the car coming to me in the street um, via a GPS. So when the kids are saying, Dad, 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 when's the pizza coming? I've worked out a way to stream it to the widescreen TV. So <laughs> you just have to look at the telly to know how far the pizza is away. And in that includes, by the way, Don Mage, this sort of personalised service thing. You now have the Spotify playlist of the driver and the footy club he or she goes for. So when he gets to the door to deliver the pizza, you can have a conversation with him about what he was listening to in the car on the way here as well. Anyway, that's all sort of a sign beside the way. But Don Mage, on the release of this app, did 27% of the entire Domino's revenue in one week. And his share price went up 25%. But he didn't stop there. Because my son loves to make really horrible pizzas. Meat, 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 chilli, 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 meat, 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 chilli, chilli, chilli. What Don Mage now allows him to do is actually design those pizzas not only for himself, but he figures if Hudson Bartlett likes them, he can put them in my store. So Hudson now designs pizzas, puts them in the Domino's store, and every time you buy one of them, please, uh, <laughs> um, Hudson gets a dollar, a real Australian dollar in his bank account. Uh, now, there are kids in Australia who have made over $50,000 in pocket money by designing pizzas for Don Mage. Now, think about this. He can sack all the people who used to sit in that. All the market researchers, all the Aussie half a wine designers, all of that, gone. Because the platform, the participants on the platform are in fact co-constructing the product and the innovation along the way on the fly. Hudson, unfortunately, has not reached the $50,000 mark. He's lucky to meet the $5 mark. But I can assure you, the Commodore, the Mustang, and the Aventador, that's his other obsession, of course, get hotter as you go up the speed of the car, names for Hudson pizzas, so just be careful when you're ordering them. Um, now, the person I'm replacing today, in fact, Mel Irons, or, or extending my talk into her time, um, many of you will know as the young woman who extraordinarily, after the fires swept through southeast Ta uh, Tasmania two years ago, set up a Facebook page called Tassie Fires We Can Help. If you think about that, and I always think of the Dorothy McKellar poem because at the same time my father lives 400 kilometres west of Brisbane in the Lockyer Valley, and at the same time the, f the fire was bearing down on our little shack at, um, on the Tasman Peninsula, his house was under flood for the um, third time in four years. Uh, but if you think about what she did, I'm not trying to paraphrase her speech, is she actually set up a marketplace, very simply on Facebook, in which those in need after the fires could get together with those who needed, um, who wanted to give. In fact, a whole 500 boat flotilla 
was organised without government being involved via her Facebook page, this platform, this marketplace, on which the participants co-created and co-constructed um, all of the solutions to the people who had just undergone this horrible uh, natural disaster. Similarly, but way out there on a different tangent, uh, Unilever, if you washed your hair um, this morning, Malcolm, I'm not sure whether you... Uh, uh, if you washed your hair this morning, chances are you used a shampoo product that's owned by Unilever, right? Because they own pretty much every shampoo product on the planet. Um, the interesting thing about what this is, is a YouTube channel owned by Unilever, right? But free. Basically, sitting up a YouTube channel is free. What they do, though is they've create, what they've done with this YouTube channel is create a platform on which others can create content for them. And what they do in real time is buy all of the Google data about people searching for stuff about hair around the world. So Game of Thrones just ends, I don't watch it, but say the princess has a fantastic hairdo and about 100 or million people around the world go to Google and type in, how do I do the princess from Game of Thrones hairdo. They collect up all that data instantly and they feed it out to a community of about 10,000 vloggers, which are bloggers that make videos, basically. And they say, this is the trending search data on Google. So what do the vloggers do? They all create a video on how to do the hairdo from the princess in Game of Thrones. What does Unilever do? For free, aggregates up all that um, how-to video, if you like, and puts it on their site. So we, they know that if you go and search now for Princess's Hairdo Game of Thrones, the only site that's going to top the list will be theirs, and they will have a thousand videos showing you how to um, do the Princess's Hairdo in, on Game of Thrones. Now, to me, this is platform meets um, big data uh, meets this thing I want to introduce to you now, which is, I'm just checking my time, the expectation uh, economy. And that is, I've got to break a light globe there because since being out of politics, my wife and I, uh, when the, a light globe blows in the bathroom, say, the first thing we say to each other is, what's the government doing about that anyway? <laughs> we kind of like that as Australians, don't we? What's the government doing about that anyway? What our government, I'll never forget as Minister for Education, I got in the lift once, I'd only been Minister for Education for about three weeks and a, a woman got in the lift next to me, this is a diversion by the way, uh, got in the lift next to me and she said, when are you going to stop girls from wearing makeup at your schools? And I turned to her and I said, oh, why, why do you ask? She said, well, my daughter wears makeup and I can't seem to stop her. And she goes to Ogilvy by the way, so I don't know if the principal of Ogilvy is here. Uh, uh, but I think your school should. And I think that's a classic, what's the government doing about it anyway, kind of uh, explain. Because we as parents have completely devolved all responsibility for our children to you to fix all those problems. That's partly the expectation economy. But in this space that we're talking about, the digital, and the other expectation economy in the old world is, uh, hands up if you're one of those people that gets into a lift and the doors aren't closing quickly enough and you have to push that button, you know, with the arrows. Pump. Come on, hands up, all of you. Right, you're part of the problem. Uh, I am too. But what I'm saying is, because we have become so accustomed, and increasingly so, to the uh, consumer aspects of our digital lives and our ubiquitous connectivity, we are starting, certainly as parents and as learners, to expect the same experience. And this is a, I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. I suspect it's a bad thing. But I'm telling you, it's happening, and it's something that um, we need to respond to. So let me just tell you a couple of quick stories about that. I was on a plane um, from San Francisco to Toronto last year, and the steward, um, air steward, got up and announced, uh, you're lucky people, We're, this is the first flight out of San Francisco on this airline that has free high-speed Wi-Fi on board. Everybody got out their laptops. You beauty, I'm still connected, you know. Uh, so, got out the laptop, halfway through the flight, you know, somewhere over Chicago, um, the steward comes out again and says, I'm very sorry, ladies and gentlemen, the Wi-Fi's gone down. The guy sitting next to me goes, oh, that's bullshit, unbelievable, you know? So, 
in 24 hours, we'd gone from not having Wi-Fi on the plane to being really pissed off when it went down. Hey, you know the you lot who put your hand up at the lift? That's you. It's me as well. I was pretty grumpy about it too. Interestingly, I don't know if anyone uh, catches Ubers around, uh, they're not in Hobart yet. Uh, anyone Uber riders? Right. So Uber did some research and looked at, in 2013, the orange line is basically the average wait time uh, for how long you wait for your Uber to come. I don't know what these people are doing. Who's waiting 20 minutes for an Uber? Not me. Uh, but the average time was about the sort of eight-minute mark, basically. They did the same study one year later. Uber had only been in this city one year. And the entire graph shifted a minute and a half to the left. That is, we'd got so used to getting our Uber on time that we're going to wait a lot less for that now. Um, similarly, this is a new <laughs> innovation. Uh, this is the bu a button, talk about one touch. I don't need to log in and order my new grocer my groceries or my, um, in this case, um, uh, I've run out of uh, washing detergent. Uh, I just push that button. It's Wi-Fi enabled, it's connected to my credit card. The next day, my, uh, I wouldn't want my kids anywhere near that. Boom, boom, boom. We have 300 uh, boxes of Tide. Interestingly though, I think also there's some expectations about how we use our resources starting to emerge out of the expectation economy. Audi have just released this app that you can now buy a car with five of your friends and the app allows you to manage the sharing of that car. Down to pay paying the lease, paying the petrol, managing who does what kilometres, where the car's parked, who you pick it up from, the bookings, all of those sorts of things. Now if Audi are creating, I'm not saying this as a direct, any of these stories that I'm about to tell have a direct implication for schools necessarily, but what they're doing is opening up this space in which consumers are starting to expect stuff and expect the world to behave in that way. And when our schools and our institutions, and particularly our governments, aren't able to do that, there's going to be some challenges, I think. The other thing about the expectation economy is this sort of rise of two-way transparency, and this has been going on for a long time. eBay, back in 2000 even, you know, you rated the buyer or you rated the seller. People who have used eBay would know that. Of course, Airbnb now, you rate your guests and they rate you as a host. Uber, you rate the driver, they rate you as a passenger. So this two-way transparency is becoming a massive part of the expectation economy. Um, in fact, at Pret, um, uh, coffee you know, uh, part, um, franchise basically, they now give money, allowances to the wait staff to give freebies. So if you treat the wait staff not badly, you ain't getting a freebie. But it's within the authority of the wait staff to give the free coffee if you've been nice. The behaviours in Pret cafes have gone off the scale nice. Everybody is being nice. Because part of the expectation economy is this currency of exchange, that I'll do this for you and you'll do that for me. And in sharing the things that we're doing on the platform that we're operating on, we're going to all do well out of it. However, there's also, I think, a bit of a dark side to this two-way transparency. And I think about this in the context of your daily jobs and what you do every day. And I see it actually played out in the school um, community, I must say. This is a $10 stapler from Officeworks. It has 581 customer reviews. <laughs> Six questions were answered. It's a stapler. <laughs> you know, oh, I mean, what is going on here? If you think there's 582 people rating and ranking and discussing, yes, it staples, no, it doesn't staple. <laughs> <laughs> if there's 581 reviews on the Officeworks website for a $10.82 stapler, what expectation is that raising in your school communities about how your schools behave and how they interact with that community. I think it's massive implications. And this currencies of change, if you like, that exchange of currency that ain't, ain't dollars, and we're back to the EverQuest gold coin almost, is changing people's behaviours and what they expect. Uh, many of the commercial operators are getting into this. Nike now, who's wearing a piece of wearable fitness 
technology like a jawbone, a uh, um, or a Fitbit, or a, right, yep, some of the early adopters in the room. Uh, Nike, now, if you're wearing a jawbone, you can go up to this vending machine in New York. The more steps you've done, the more discount you get on products out of their vending machine. IS, which is like, a, if anyone uses Strava, to, who uses Strava to go for a run or a ride? Yep. So you map your ride, you go for a ride and post on your, on your basically social network the, the map of where you rode. You know, I rode four hours the other day and all my mates said, aren't you great? And I felt really good about it. Well, with IS, if you use their technology and you run their logo on the map, you get freebies. Harvard at Pilgrim Healthcare is now providing an app that allows shoppers to scan their groceries and if you buy healthy stuff, they'll give you money off your health insurance. Perhaps more strangely, in Brazil, hair care brand is exchanging shampoo bottles for um, credit on your SIM card for your phone. Put in the more shampoo bottles you put in, the more dollars I get on my SIM card. Alpha Bank, which is a Russian bank, interest, interestingly, is um, using the sort of healthy and wealthy idea to say, the more you run with your fitness device, the better interest rate we're going to give you. I think this is the best of them all, though. This is a rock festival in um, Romania. <laughs> the more you give blood, the greater the discount off your... What a great marketing device, sorry. The more you give blood, the bigger discount. You had to give blood 17 times to get a free ticket, basically. It was probably unhealthy, I suspect. But this, is, this expectation economy on top of the platform economy is having big implications for all institutions and all businesses. When my mates and I go to, um, and I've probably got about three minutes left, so I'm going to go really quickly. Um, when my mates and I go to a long liquid lunch, which we're going to do tomorrow, no, not tomorrow, because I'm here tomorrow, Friday, the rule is you have to put your mobile phone in the middle of the table and you have to leave it on, um, uh, on so you can't turn it off and it rings and it beeps and it tweets and it does buzzes and all that. And the first person to touch their phone has to pay for lunch. <laughs> so all of the OCD, you know, mildly OCD, obsessive compulsive digital freak friends of mine hate this game. <laughs> but interestingly, here's an app that's working across a number of tertiary campuses now that I think is the same thing. That basically you overlay as an institution your timetable with this app and geolocated, if you are in the lecture theatre at the time you're supposed to be in the lecture theatre and you don't touch your phone, not for a second, you earn points. And those points can be spent at the local pizza shop or the local dry cleaner or what have you around the university um, campus. So this expectation economy and these currencies of exchange within the platform are starting, I think, to have an impact. And I think, perhaps, perhaps, that schools need to consider these consumer trends and particularly deploy them via disruptive digital channels in order to engage learners and also the wider community. Perhaps that's what we're going to do for the next hour down at the Wool Store, so I'll talk more about it then. But I'm going to add, finish on this to Hudson's other great love, and that's cars. I caught him the other day, not designing pizzas, but designing cars on a game called automation. This game, when I got into it with him and worked out what he was doing, has over 100,000 variables. He can build a car from the ground up, from spark plug to drive chain to what have you, to all of the bits that go on an engine that I don't know, to the bot, that's his horrible design of uh, whatever, you know, to the body, to the whole lot, right? But then he can put that car in a marketplace and the faster it goes around the Top Gear Tress track, virtually, the more points he gets in the game, basically. Or other people will buy his innovation in his engine to plug in to their virtual car. Now, of course, cars are actually the great next disruption. You think mobile connectivity has been the great disruption. Cars are the next great technological disruption. Don't think it'll happen in a year, Bob, but it will happen in the next three. I love this tweet from someone who's been in a, recently in a driverless car. Goes from terrifying to thrilling to boring in 15 minutes. If that's not the expectation economy, you know, at work, I don't know what is. 
but essentially, and I won't go into this in great detail, but essentially cars are the next great ripe thing for digital disruption. In fact, DARPA, the US uh, basically procurement of war machines agency, um, now use a platform to co-construct vehicles like this for the theatre of war. So they've said, like Don Mage in Domino's Pizza, our experts are not as smart, no matter how, we, how many of them we employ, our experts are not as smart at building war machines or vehicles like this, designing them, as a crowd of a million people across the world plugged into our platform and co-constructing it. Isn't that extraordinary from an agency that spends billions and billions of dollars a year? But it's not that extraordinary. So there's another thing my son alerted me to. This is the Dodge Viper, and you can go to it. It's a web, live website. I can construct my own Dodge Viper car. This one's worth 95000 The one Hudson designed was 225000 We're not getting that. Uh, but I can construct it from the, from the spark plugs up again. And if someone else like, I can, then I buy my design but I can put my design in the Dodge shop. And if someone else buys my design, I get rebates off my next car. Now, by the time Hudson Bartlett gets to university, he will be, he won't have a concept of his job, because his dad never had one, uh, but that's part of the problem. Uh, but he will be designing cars using augmented and virtual reality environment on a device in his bedroom. He will sell those cars and the design for his car parts online with buyers on the other side of the planet downloading his designs and printing them in their own garage. That will be happening. My son's going to high school next year. That will be his life experience by the time he gets to university, is my fearless prediction to you. So this has implications, I think, for education. And essentially, in my next session, uh, this is what we're going to look at in much more detail. Probably terrified you all and frightened you off, so five or six of you show up, that'll be nice. Uh, we're going to talk about why this ubiquitous connectivity, additive manufacturing of 3D printing, augmented and virtual reality, together with the platform economy, is changing everything. But hopefully, we're going to drill down into a couple of practical examples of what I think schools can be doing, particularly at a primary level, to get kids engaged with this stuff. I want to do a little shout out um, to my mate Craig Clark, who's up the back. He runs Hackerspace in Hobart. And if you're wondering in your school, how do I get my head around this stuff and think about what I could get my kids involved with, which, which um, um, brings this stuff to life for them, um, then I'd go and look up your local hacker space. There's a great one in Hobart that Craig runs. He'll be inundated with schools wanting to come visit him now. But it's an it's outstanding uh, bunch of people who can... Who, who are living this stuff right now and doing some really interesting things. So what have we learned today? The old models are dead. This is the last slide, I promise you. That's no, the second last. We used to think we need to outsource stuff, but actually we need to think in this new platform economy, and I think you need to think in your schools, that we need to upsource to the community the solutions. That's what uh, Domino's is doing. Upsourcing to a community of pizza lovers the design of their pizzas, and we need to downsource to shared infrastructure. That is, we need, that's what Hudson's doing. He doesn't own a pizza shop, but he's using the shared infrastructure of Domino's Pizza to have his own pizza shop. And we as schools, I think, need to think in that way, and I'll put it in these terms. We need to behave less like Lonely Planet, tablets of stone, here's the answer, and more like TripAdvisor, we're a platform on which learning and co-construction of that learning and sharing of that learning um, uh, happens. Lastly, then, I draw your attention to my friend Trimetheus, who I always use this slide because inevitably people say, oh, yeah, but that's all bad. Well, it may be all bad. It may have bad repercussions. It may mean that kids can't spell, oh, my God, anymore because they say OMG instead or whatever, right? There might be bad implications. But Trimetheus wrote a book called In Praise of Scribes in 1492. Scribes were people employed at vast wages by the Catholic Church to write the scriptures. Of course, the printing press had come along and they were under great threat, great threat. So Trimetheus wrote this book and I love it. I've read the whole thing, but you can Google a bunch of um, uh, um, quotes. He who ceases the work of a scribe because of printing is not a true friend of the scripture because heeding no more than the present, he takes no care to educate posterity. I love the bit, printed books 
will never equal scribed books, especially because of the spelling and ornamentation of some printed books is often neglected. Now, within about 100 years of Trimetheus writing this book, the Catholic Church did not employ one scribe. <laughs> they had printing presses all over the shop. What I'm trying to end on, I guess, is a lot of this change is inevitable. We might not think it's good. We might think it has threats and opportunities, but it's inevitable, and therefore we need to understand what those threats and opportunities are. And with that, I thank you very much. And you can find me in all the usual places.